Thank you. Okay, I am going to call to order a meeting of the Planning and Economic Development Committee at 7.06 p.m. in the Aldermatic Chamber. And if the clerk would call the roll, please. Certainly. Um, Alderwoman Marianne Melissi Goya. Present. Alderman Ernest Jetty. Here. Alderman at large David C. Tenza. Alderman at large Brandon Michael Laws. Here. And I am here, Alderman Jan Schmidt. Okay, thank you. We have a quorum. Um, Alderman Tenza contacted me um, last week and told me he had a family conflict and so he would be unable to attend this evening. Thank you. So um, we also have in attendance um, Director Marchant from Community Development and um, Director McCormick from the Nashua Public Library. Um, Director Cummings is not with us this evening. Um, public comment? None. So, um, as many of you know, and um, you've probably also read about in the um, paper, the library is working on a redesign of Library Plaza. And so this evening we have Director Marchant and Director McCormick with us to talk about um, how that process is moving. And so Director Marchant had to leave the chamber for a minute, but I'm going to ask Director McCormick to come up and um, wherever you're comfortable. Okay, thank you. Um, and. Well, um, Director Marchant is out. I was just wondering, for the public, if you might want to just talk about the upcoming public input event that you have planned. Oh, absolutely. So on Thursday evening at the library, Thursday, May 23rd, we are hoping, we are not hoping, we are holding a public comment session. The architects will be there to give a brief pres presentation. They'll have some 3D renderings of their proposed plans for the public to look at and comment on. And that starts at 6 p.m. Okay, and is that located in the auditorium? Or? No, in the large meeting room in the, okay. in the Chandler wing. Okay, all right. So um, public comment, 6 p.m. and down in the large meeting room yep. in the Chandler wing. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Director Marchand has joined us, so um, if the two of you would like to start your presentation. And you have everything there, great. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So <coughs> I, I'm going to start with just setting the stage for how we got here. So the plaza renovation is a priority of both the Board of Trustees and the Mayor, and the Mayor was able to identify some funds um, that, for us to use for this planning process. And there are a number of problems that we hope this renovation will address, and then there's a couple of opportunities that we think it presents as well. If you've been to the library recently, you know that the grounds out in front of us, the plaza area being the grassy, the concrete and grassy area between our front door and the entrance to the Court Street Theater, and all the way from the public parking lot to Court Street itself. So it's a... To us, it's a fairly sizable plot, but from the city's perspective, it's a fairly small plot of land. The condition of the grounds has really deteriorated. The building opened almost 50 years ago, um, and it has never had any irrigation. It's poorly lit. The concrete has deteriorated, and the pitch is leading to water infiltration in the building. It's also not an accessible route from our handicapped spots on either end, either the parking lot end or the Court Street end. Um, there was a lot of excess vegetation, which was impeding the sight lines for our security cameras and allowing for a lot of trash and debris to accumulate. Um, and there were some less than desirable activities happening. So we tore out a lot of vegetation, which didn't improve the aesthetics, although it did improve the security camera coverage. Uh, we hold a lot of programs out there. There's a weekly concert series, many children's activities, some major city events like Nashua Goes Back to School. The library holds its summer reading kickoff event. Um, both of those attract a couple thousand people every year. Um, but there is actually no power 
on that side of the, uh, once you leave the building, once you cross that walkway, there's no power or water over there. So we do a lot of stringing extension cords with mats over them or just telling people they can't have power. And there's actually no irrigation or water over there. So any ideas we've ever had for planting improvements are not really feasible. Uh, I, this sounds like a long list of complaints. Um, there's also been a lot of erosion along the walkway and we've spent some money over the years trying to shore that up. But So that's a safety hazard that emerges about every other year. The runoff from the concrete down the walkway erodes it and there's been a couple of minor injuries. So this renovation hopefully will solve all of that and it will do more than that. I think it will improve that space. Uh, the plans that will show you just a couple of slides from the proposal will incorporate an active part of that plaza that will be available for people to use whether they're coming to visit the library or not. So it can be a destination for that neighborhood. Uh, we have a lot of kids use us that are in that middle school age. They're old enough to be out roaming about by themselves, but maybe not old enough to have a car to go anywhere. So we're talking like 11 to 14 year olds. They could use something to do right in the downtown area that's active. It'll improve accessibility, which is a major priority for all of us, for our elderly users, but also just people with mobility issues. It also will provide better connections. So a physical connection between us and the Court Street Theater and kind of that more emotional, mental connection, that the activities that are happening in the 14 Court Street building, the new artist studi studios, the Peacock Players, the Nashua Symphony, those are organizations we already have partnerships with, but improving that space between us will make that connection, I think, a little more concrete for the public. Um, and the last thing I would say is our 50th anniversary is coming up. In 20, September 2021, it'll be 50 years since the doors opened, and I'm working with our Board of Trustees on some plans for some big celebrations. Uh, we're considering the installation of a new um, piece of art for the plaza. Uh, and we really hope that these plans come to fruition and the construction is done by then. So we, the board and the city will have something really terrific to celebrate. Great. May I just, um, one thing, how many sculptures are currently there? Is it three? Oh no, one, one, two, three. There's five on the front lawn, and then there's right. Ghost Wilkie in the back, so that makes oh, right. six. And then one, the turtle that's currently in Bicentennial Park is moving to be with its turtle brother and sister um, probably next year, so there'll okay. be seven. There'll be seven, all from the Sculpture Symposium. I believe so, yes. Right. I'm not sure about the reading pair that's outside our doors. Oh, no. So that, that was purchased, I think, by the Burbank Fund. Right. Right, right, but the rest are sculptures, yep. symposium yep. sculptures. Okay, thank you. All right, so just kicking it off a little bit, um, Jen gave you a lot of the background that has been, uh, Director McCormick, sorry, um, <laughs> that, that has led us to this point. And so um, we've been working with um, CRJA um, architects, landscape architects, and, uh, and the goal of this is we have a team comprised of um, library, directors um, and the library board, uh, representatives from the Sculpture Symposium, the Nashua Arts Committee, uh, Public Works, uh, Community Development, and- Great American Great, Downtown. Thank you, Great American <laughs> Downtown. And so we, we have a pretty, and um, the Downtown Improvement Committee. And so we have a pretty broad brush of um, a core group that are, um, that evaluated consultants when we went out for RFP and initially chose CRJA to um, start this project off. And I just have one slide, two slides here to talk you through tonight, just so that you have an idea of more of this discussion that will happen on Thursday and how we got here. So um, what generally when we're looking at um, something that we're looking for great public feedback on, the best way to get people to tell you what they like and don't is to show them something visual. It's much easier to say, I like this idea, I don't like this idea, with an image to react to than us saying, we want to fix um, the lack of vegetation and we want to have more public space. It, it's not concrete enough to get good responses from. So 
Um, based on discussions with that core group of people, CRJA has put together um, and knowing some of the goals that the library has clearly stated and some of the needs that we know are out there that have not yet been met, um, they have put together uh, two <coughs> designs that they will go through with 3D renderings and all kinds of cool things Thursday night. Um, but this is the idea behind what they're looking at. So just to orient you, this is the main parking lot. There's the library here. And here's Court Street Theater on the far side. Uh, sorry, Court Street, the road, and Court Street Theater on the, the northern portion. And the idea is to look at this as a more of a recreation space, a performance space in the middle, and more of a passive space where the terraced areas are up here. Um, in addition to really kind of creating this stronger entrance line and sight line here, um, and a spot for a food truck. <laughs> There's so many events and so many people say, Where's, why can't we have a food truck? But when you have no electricity and no water, it's hard to support something like that. Um, and what you can't see on this image is there are significant grade changes in this area. And we do have a history of a large amount of asbestos in this area um, that's documented. And so we're just, we're very cognizant of some of the environmental issues and how we can pull all this together reasonably. So this is a cross section. Um, here's a plan you were just looking at in the top corner with a, a red line through the middle. And that's what you're looking at if we looked at it straight through the middle. So if we're standing in the middle here, we're coming out the library door. This gives you a sense of the change in grade here of where it would be more of a recreation space, a performance space here, and then the uh, more passive space and the stronger connections to, um, to 14 Court Street. So the idea of a process here, um, there'll be a much more in-depth presentation Thursday night, um, but we'd really love the community's feedback. I know Jen and her team have gotten a lot through their newsletter and their Facebook. We are paying attention. Um, we are pulling all of those comments in. Um, so we will have a discussion Thursday night. We will take whatever input we can. From there, the um, architects will go out and refine the designs. Um, and um, we'll take all the feedback discussions. We will make the changes. We will come up with a much more solid design. Again, this one is really to get your feedback uh, on. Um, and with, from that final design, we will then, um, they will create a full bid package for us. Um, this is being designed very much in phases. Um, it's for phases of construction. Uh, we understand that we don't have all the money set up initially right now to fund this. Um, we have a small piece of it, but this is a priority project. And so we want to be able to make sure that whatever the community wants, that it has a general budget to it and that it is allowed to be phased over time, knowing that we it would be wonderful if we could do the whole shebang, but um, we do have many, many priorities in the city. So that is the goal here. Um, it is unlikely that you would see this whole plan completed in one fell swoop, I think. Um, and so the idea is to have a bid documents together, uh, the plan done for the end of the summer, bid documents together for the fall. Um, we always get best bid pricing uh, over the winter. Um, so we'd be looking to fund some of the improvements in the next budget cycle anyways. And I think we'd be happy to answer questions mm -hmm. at this point. Questions? Alderman Jetty. So could you tell me um, <coughs> What the different colors mean, you know, to the... In here? Yes. So that's a surface of the play space, and it's uh, meant to reflect the colors that are in the library um, that are part of your um, branding. Perfect. Right. So those that's actually an artificial surface, and those colors are meant to represent the possibility of introducing actual color into that surface. So it's the same, same as the National Library brand. So, so that w it would be some impervious surface, like correct, like cement or well, no, like astroturf, something a little softer, so um, kids could play on that. Uh, one concept that's been discussed is a uh, uh, what did we, we we had a funny so I think Jonathan was calling it like a CrossFit structure for adults. So if you can picture like you know the monkey bars when you were a kid, but something similar for adults. Possibly a playground for young children. Um, we've had comments asking for a basketball court. Uh, one suggestion was a small soccer pitch, so kids in the neighborhood could kick around a soccer ball. But that's meant to represent 
actual colors of some artificial surface. And if I may follow up, will it will it drain, or is it, is it totally impervious to? Drainage would be built in. It okay. um, it will drain. It is okay. it is an impervious surface. It would be a runoff. Okay. Um, it would be a soft, squishier runoff surface that's meant for outside. It will drain. There would be designed drainage included in this. And there's actually quite a bit of um, LID, low impact drainage, that is part of this proposal. So that we're not adding you know hard catch basin drainage necessarily, but being able to utilize a lot of the green and resources that are on the site to better help with the drainage and managing the grades significantly better than we are at the moment. Yeah, I feel like I I know the grades in my sleep <laughs> and the potholes. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> Um, Alderman Jetty. I'm not going to be able to be there Thursday night, so if, you know, I, my, my my initial reaction is, um, you know, it, it, it you know, is uh, I, I guess my question is, is there a, a reason for that as opposed to maintaining some kind of a you know a grassy surface? I think one reason is the library doesn't employ a groundskeeper, so the less lawn we have to take care of, the better. Um, I, I guess I'll let Sarah answer more as sure. to the benefits of that surface over grass. When we went through the goals for this space and what um, all these collective groups want to see and what we look at the downtown as a whole, there aren't, there is not a lot of open green space and there is not a lot of recreation space for families um, and kids. And the library has a lot of amazing programs and so does the 14 Court Street. And there's a lot of children and families going between those two buildings. And the idea was try to find a way to give them a place or a space that's a destination unto itself, as Jen said, and to try and draw them in, people who maybe aren't using those facilities as well. As well, So um, we have very positive results with playgrounds that have some eyes on them, which th this space would have. Um, and we think it would just be a benefit to to go with the program. The other reason is that um, it, it works with the grades. The space is kind of divided into three. So if you look right here on this edge, this is actually a retaining wall that would be, you could sit on if you were here, but there needs to be, to make this space flat and this space usable for, for, for performance or events, you need to fix some of the grades. And so there's a retaining wall here and the other design, there's also a wall of some kind here. You kind of need to break these spaces up. Um, this middle space is designed to be able to capitalize on this big blank wall on 14 Court Street in some ways. So if you wanted to project movie screens or um, you wanted to use that for art in some way. Um, we're also really bringing back in the, the tie between 14 Court Street and the National Library this, with the ADA ramps. If you haven't been here in a while, this doesn't connect anymore at all. Um, and it doesn't provide, a, the only ADA access is to go out of Court Street and to go all the way down around here. Um, and, and I guess that doesn't even really work. So um, we're trying to provide a connection and access between the two buildings again as well. And I think for all the events we looked at that are currently being held there and that perform the space that um, the library believes they need, there wasn't a reason to make all of this just green space. Alderman Laws. First of all, I love both of you, and I, this is great. And I said to both of you privately, I'm very excited about this. I think the library is an incredibly underused asset to the city. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jen, or Director McCormick, is uh, the National Library, I heard, is the biggest library north of Boston in North America. Oh, that I have not heard that. I, I think Manchester might fight us on that, yeah? but it's close. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll fight Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Canada is in North America. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's what, that, that's what was impressive about it. I, I heard it was bigger than anything in Canada. No offense to Canadians. Uh, my my only concern would be, I mean, so over 50 years, it, it, the ground has shifted to a point where the original design no longer looks the same, right? Is that a possibility to happen again after we invest this money here? Is the, yeah. 
I think the engineering standards today and knowing what's happened with the shifting before, um, the way the library was designed has some really interesting drainage and the architectural structure, right? How it kind of looks like it's floating and has um, the moat around the edge of it. We can take a lot of what we know about how the water flows right now into consideration and with engineering, I think it will be a much more durable design. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, 20, 30 years, I think is a very reasonable expectation. I don't know about 50, but I do think that um, the engineering standards in what we know since this building has gone into place will help us design a much more durable um, structures to be put in. Excellent. Other than shedding, oh, and then other than shoes. So uh, okay, you're talking about reconnecting the, the two buildings. They were connected. Do you know why they were disconnected? So if you look at that, um, that yeah, where that corridor sort of where Sarah is has the cursor, there were two stairways. So a stairway there and then another stairway. They were concrete steps and they were deteriorating and sloping, which though they were not safe. Additionally, they were being used as a skateboard ramp. So we had skateboarders all the time, and I have nothing against skateboarders, but they would start up at that very top, right at the door to the Court Street Theater, and fling themselves down, <laughs> all the way down that ramp, and jump off that retaining wall onto the plaza, uh, which is terrifying and um, it really not safe. So I spoke to the mayor at the time, we identified a very small amount of money. DPW reclaimed some granite curbing from solid waste and just took out those steps and added planters. It was a really quick solution. Um, someone from community development designed some plantings that were meant to be hardy. Um, some of them have thrived, some have not. So we solved the skateboarding problem and we solved the unsafe stair stairway problems, but we as a result, also kind of closed down that connection between the two buildings. And follow up and then all the mention. So, um, so you you uh, you disconnected it to mm -hmm. solve the skateboarding problem, mm -hmm. and when you reconnect it, huh, are you going to recreate another skateboarding problem? Well, it might. I think I think the improved grading will help. And we did talk to Jonathan about that, and they have a number of techniques that they use to discourage skateboarding, but that's certainly on our list of things to watch out for. Thank you. Um, <coughs> this design, as far as the playground area, is a really great idea because what you can create a surface that is permeable, that water will seep through. Right now, there's, um, there's no edges. Kids play Correct. and they, you know, there's somebody reading a book over here, they're in the way. Dividing it up is really going to be a great idea because it'll help people be in where they want to be and have another space nearby. But the uh, the material that's used for the playground is perfect for kids. It's It, it gives, it, it allows uh, water to go through, it's safer. And um, I think a lot of parents will feel a lot better about their kids playing in that area. And there will be a <laughs> barrier to the parking area, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. correct. So, perfect. Thank you. Other questions? I have a couple. I'm looking at this, of course, you know, I'm thinking how I'm going to program this. If yes. I'm <laughs> still programming this space every August. Um, no, I think, first of all, I think it's great. and. Um, and I think reestablishing that connection is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and especially the ramp that is enclosed as part of the plaza and not, oh, you have to leave this great right. space mm -hmm. to enter it another way, but you can still be part of the activity mm -hmm. if you're using that ramp. Um, and um, I think Director McCormick, I think you and I had one conversation about this, and I know Director Marshall and I have had a couple. I just think um, providing that space for programs, whatever it may be, a concert or a festival, whatever, in the center, and then having that other space that is very clearly delineated by not only the wall but the change in surface as a kid's space is great. Um, and I have one question about the material. So um, 
we do the the preschool, the daycare. Um, you do the event. Um, you do it usually like in February. Or oh, March. the early childhood. Early care, childhood yes. event, yep. right? So if they wanted, say, the early childhood community wanted to do something when the weather was good. I'm not sure when that would be because May doesn't seem to be the time <laughs> either. Um, but if they wanted to do something out on that space, will this surface? Will they be able to like have paints and you know do all of those sorts of things out there? Yes. Um, so I mean, as long as they're water based, absolutely. Right. Um, there is also on the side over here, which I think is the okay. the most the most dangerous because of the amount of asbestos that we know is on this bank, but still has possibility. There's kind of an outdoor classroom area that right. they've been talking about here with um, working with the grading <laughs> here to allow some space as well. And um, as part of the riverfront project, we are planning to remove a whole lot of trees along okay. this riverfront to open it up. And so there would be a better tie to this area, which has a great view of, um, of the riverfront here. So um, yes, I think, um, there's room on this space as well. I think that the, the whole point of the design was based on what kind of an activity you want to do. It might be there. You know, there's um, there's built-in checker tables and chess tables over mm -hmm. here. We've talked about other kinds of um, things that you could borrow from the library and use in the space um, and mm -hmm. ways that to repurpose, you know, to use this space maybe not only just as a playground, especially if there's more of that sport court involved, um, you know, using cornhole out there or doing other things as well to kind of allow this to be a really a community space that people can use for multi multiple purposes. Right. Um, is the fountain going to remain? No, the fountain is n no longer functional and the board has decided not to invest any more funds in it. So okay. that's, that's fine. I was just looking at this, wondering if I missed it or if it was mm. truly gone. Um, and then I guess my, my only other big question is, um, what are the thoughts about lighting? Up lighting of trees, um, big lights, low lights? As part of the plan, so as part of the team doing this design, there is a lighting expert. You know, they, ha they have a lighting engineer right. involved. Um, he's presented a few ideas. Um, we haven't really seen a concrete lighting plan. Okay. That's one of the values of the plan is better lighting and lighting throughout the space right. so they won't be shadowed areas that you don't feel safe. Um, you know, we didn't talk about this, but I'm wondering how many of them would be solar powered and did that come up and I missed it. Um, so yeah, we um, frown on using solar powered lights um, because of the uh, lack of reliability we found throughout mm -hmm. the city. So okay. part of this is absolutely, especially we talked briefly about the phasing. The idea is to make sure we, with phase one plan that we're addressing the, um, the drainage issues around the entryway, the accessibility issues, and pulling those electrical and water lines towards that green space. If we, you know, to break it down to the smallest, most important first phase, um, I absolutely think that lighting is a great conversation that's still to be had. The lighting designer plans to illuminate all that space, and by pulling the electric over there and providing for it in phase one, hopefully we can do more than that, but we'll be ready to be able to really illuminate this space in a nice way. I don't necessarily think it will be up lighting. I do think it will be creative use of LEDs. There's a lot of great technology out there now, um, certainly lighting all the walkways, but also providing um, a general, uh, they talked a lot about um, creating a feel of the space through lighting. Mm -hmm. And so that will be included with it. Okay. And you just mentioned um, pulling the electrical and water. Are you envisioning like at each level a, a Place where you'll be able to hook up to water or potentially at least one one it, each uh, probably more um, okay. it depends on which space and the budget right. Right. <laughs> um, but absolutely um, I, that seems to be an endemic problem that we need to a systemic problem that we need right. to solve here and pulling it everywhere is better right yeah okay thank you mm -hmm. um, any other questions comments all right, well, thank you. I, I think this is really exciting. Um, when we think of the city, we always think of Greeley Park, but in terms of downtown and south of the river, this is really the play space and the park space and the come and relax space. And um, so I think this is great that as we head towards the 50th anniversary, we're looking at 
at really um, refreshing the space and also considering the new neighbors at Court Street and, and tying all of that together so it becomes another little focal point within the city. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Look forward to hearing about what comes out of Thursday night. Yes. Thanks. So, Director McCormick, we thank you. We are not allowing Director Marchant to leave. <laughs> I will stay. <laughs> and um, if the record could show that um, Alderwoman Kelly joined us at 7.30. Thank you. So the next item on our agenda is a memorandum which I believe you received from the planning board, <clears throat> and it's around our policies um, regarding the sidewalk ordinance. And um, Alderman Tenza, as the liaison to the planning board, has been involved in some of this discussion. He and I talked about this briefly. I attended the last part of the workshop that the planning board had a couple weeks ago re regarding um, the sidewalk policy. And so uh, just so people know what the expectations are, we do not expect to come out with some resolution to how do we deal with this tonight. But um, Director Marchant and I thought it would be good to just start the conversation and then um, find out what information the committee would like so we can continue that conversation and um, decide in which direction we would like to go. So I'm going to turn it over to Director Marchant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the planning board has, um, there's a long standing, as you see in there, in your packet, um, section of the, the Nashua ordinances which deal with sidewalks when a subdivision is occurring specifically. So this is not about site plans, it's about subdivisions. Um, and it goes back to the early 2000s um, where we were through the last master plan where the goal was to build sidewalks and trails in all kinds of appropriate places throughout the city. And so the ordinance generally states that every subdivision requires you to put in a sidewalk in front of it. Um, if you don't think that a sidewalk is needed, you can ask them for a waiver and make a contribution to the sidewalk fund instead. If you make a contribution to the sidewalk fund, it goes to that quadrant fund. And it is used, and we use it, DPW uses it all the time, to build sidewalks in the area around it, um, where they're actually needed versus, say, on some side street that doesn't have any other sidewalks around it. Um, I think the planning board has done very well with this overall. Um, Every six months or so, they get an odd lot that, say, has two frontages or three frontages or has some weird funkiness to it. You know, it's a sidewalk across the street on part of it but not on the other part of it where it's just not entirely clear how they should be interpreting the ordinance. So they were reaching out to you for a kind of policy look at the sidewalk ordinance and how that how that rule is, um, if and if generally, as it's stated, you know everybody has to have a sidewalk, and the only waiver is to make a contribution in lieu of, or if there are places where they should be waiving sidewalk requirements altogether, which they don't do now. Um, many people ask for because nobody wants to make the extra payment, um, and so, you know, I I do think that this has made a huge contribution to us being able to build out sidewalks in the city because there isn't other funds to do this necessarily. Lots of priorities, right? Um, and so that's the goal here. Um, there's some information in the packet that was attached. I'm wondering if there's more information I can provide to you to help us have a more robust conversation about it. Um, the, <laughs> you know, we're, we have a the map from the 2000 master plan that is almost 20 years old. And so some of this conversation, I think, does absolutely need to dovetail and feed into the larger master plan conversation. Um, but because the planning board kind of runs into a, a more major conundrum on this every six months or so about how they should be interpreting it, they could just be looking for guidance from you at this point as well. So, so comments, thoughts? I will just while you're gathering your, your thoughts, um, I would just comment that um, 
recently we used some of the money for the Southwest Quadrant to build a section of sidewalk that was not there between between um, two other sections of sidewalk along East Dunstable Road where people were walking on East Dunstable down the sidewalk. Then um, the homeowner contacted me and said, they can walk on my grass, but they're walking in the road. And where they were walking to was a bus stop on East Dunstable or the little neighborhood grocery or market in the um, gas station or on up to a McDonald's. So um, he was noticing a lot of foot traffic and concern that people were in the street rather than walking on his lawn. And so he said, I have no problem with the city building a sidewalk there. So um, we worked with DPW and that sidewalk's going in the spring. They were out measuring in the fall and that will go in. So just so you have a sense of where that money might go. Yes, was Alderman fund, Was Schmidt. this fund also used for Broad Street? Some of it was, yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's the four quadrants, but yes, absolutely. Yep. It, it is so welcomed on, on that very busy street with kids walking, uh, people, everybody uses that, and it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to DPW, too. You know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Every day. Yeah. So Alderman Jetty. So um, I'm looking at the, what was attached to the agenda, <coughs> and uh, I'm assuming this is from the revised ordinances. It's It says uh, section 190-212 land use. Is that, that is correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So under um, paragraph D, subparagraph 1, um, it talks about waivers, and um, and then there's a it says principal frontage sidewalk required. What, can you explain what that is? What what is that supposed to be? Uh, um, so the this thing in the middle. The thing in the middle of the house, and so oh. um, so it's saying that the side that you the sidewalk is required on the main frontage, but if they have side and rear frontages, no sidewalk is required. So it's a diagram explaining what is intended. Okay. And under uh, this apparently was was written in two thousand eight. Um, Sections of it were. The original tent was from 2002. Um, and then this section was, I think, 2006. But I think so, so the, the 4 1 2008 is, um, I think, the larger chapter. So under the uh, figure, so this is evidently an overhead view. Correct. Right. So underneath that, uh, it says comment. And I'd like you to explain what this means. An example of a sidewalk waiver is multiple frontage lots. Then the next sentence, in these situations, sidewalk construction along frontages other than the principal frontage of the lot, period. Then the next sentence, in those situations, pedestrian access is only from one of the frontages, period. The sidewalk requirements may be waived on the other frontages. What, what does that mean? <coughs> I think you see some of the planning board's conundrum when interpreting this ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, the way they, so what I, I just want to be clear that this section on waivers doesn't really give them the ability to actually waive the requirement of providing a si sidewalk. It gives them the ability to allow for you to do the contribution in lieu of sidewalks. So D and E seem to directly contradict each other in some ways, which is why we keep running into this. Um, I don't think that it is entirely clear. The practice has been that if, um, if you have a lot that, say, is on Concord Street and side street off Concord Street. Uh, thank you, Cortland. Concord and Cortland, you're on the corner of that. We consider that two fronts on the two roads and two sides. 
If Concord Street already has a sidewalk, you don't need to pay the contribution for that. But if you're not building and you're subdividing the lot into two, you'd have to pay the frontage, you'd have to pay the contribution in lieu of for the Cortland Street. Um, if there is no sidewalk on Concord Street, then in there, there's all these situations, right? And there's a sidewalk across the street, they don't make you pay for the sidewalk on Concord Street. If there is not a sidewalk across the street, and they then you have to pay for the, both sides frontages. Because this section, this you're just asking me about one little piece of this, and if you read D and E, it, it has a lot more situations that tend to contradict each other. Um, and that's that's why they're kind of, they've they've come up with a system that they, I think, have employed pretty well to try and be consistent and fair. Um, because this isn't, the waivers are not requested um, for large subdivisions, right? If somebody is out um, in the southwest quadrant and they're going to build 40 houses out there, they're putting sidewalks in and they're happy to do so. And that doesn't seem to be an issue and there's no waiver request there. The waiver requests largely come in with infill lots because somebody is subdividing a lot that, say, um, is too wide the area somebody originally had two the lots were merged and now they want to subdivide it off there's only a house on this one they have a nice big lawn on this side and they're now deciding to subdivide this off as it's allowed by zoning the way the ordinance reads you would have to charge the sidewalk contribution for the house that exists and the new lot that you're creating so you'd have to do it for the entire frontage very frequently they are asked for waivers to not provide any contribution for the house that exists because they're not changing anything on that lot. But if you think about the larger public purpose, you only get one bite at that apple. You're not going to be able to get a contribution ever again in the future for the sidewalk on that lot. So the idea and intent was originally to kind of do that. So it gets very complicated. I guess that's the very long answer. I'm sorry. And I would just say, as you know, as, <coughs> as we look at walkability in neighborhoods again you know it, we may only get one bite of that apple if we're doing some infill and it's you know in some of our more densely populated neighborhoods director marchant and then alderman jetty I so i'll just say the planning board's perspective has been to say they re have interpreted this with the contradictions to say every lot everywhere is supposed to have a sidewalk and the contribution in lieu of allows you to pay a much reduced rate to contribute to the fund to help sidewalks be in the neighborhood where they're supposed to be. So they just consider it in a totality that you can pay a contribution in lieu of, but they, that's the way that they've been looking at it. But as I said, there's contradictions in here where sometimes it appears that maybe they shouldn't be looking at it as everyone everywhere has to do it, and you can get a waiver back from that to some extent. Um, you know, if they should be looking at it a little bit differently, they haven't been. They, they've tried to apply it that way to be fair and consistent. Alderman Jetty. So my my initial comments about the comment on the, you know, is that, um, you know, that second sentence lacks a verb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know I, I, I find this a, a lot in our, Revised ordinances that you know, it's it's difficult to uh, figure out what they mean because you know uh, grammatically they make no sense, mm -hmm. and um, I, I know you're here for the larger purpose of the you know the planning um, part of it, but I, I would you know if, if it's not too much to ask as you as you see these things. Um, you know, I, I would think um, it would be helpful to us if you suggested amendments. You know that we could, uh, you know, adopt to to make this more understandable. But you know, regarding this, the sidewalk thing, I, I mean, my my own reaction is that you know I think uh, it's it's a shame. You know, this happened a long time ago, uh, but. It, you know, it's it's a shame that the city, uh, you know, did not require sidewalks. Um, I understand that that there was a period of time when the city was trying to encourage housing, and 
and, and fell into the trap of thinking that um, that it was a good thing to make housing as cheap as possible so that homeowners could could purchase them as cheaply as possible. But, um, you know, I think, you know, maybe, maybe that was the right thing to do at the time, but we're, we're, you know, we're, we're stuck now with, um, you know, large portions of the city that have no sidewalks and pedestrian, um, you know, the use of our streets by pedestrians is a problem because they cannot safely walk on the streets because of the, the automobile traffic. Um, and so now, uh, you know, if somebody's, you know, the example you give of, uh, you know, of two lots, of a, a single lot being subdivided and uh, <coughs> the owner of that property wanting a waiver from having to put in a sidewalk because the new lot you know, the existing, the the old lot is already there without a sidewalk, and now the new lot's going to put in a sidewalk. And I think, you know, that um, presumably in, in, in the subdivision, they're going to be able to sell that lot uh, at a profit and uh, and requiring them to put in the sidewalk and, and maybe shave something off of their profit. You know, my my initial reaction is that that seems fair um, that they should be able to do that, but but I I'm thinking you know we're you know we're not professional planners we're uh, we're trying to do the best we can but I I personally would like to look to you and your department to suggest to us what uh, you know what the city's position should be from a planning perspective and I know that we're we're going to we're, we're beginning to launch into a you know a, a citywide uh, plan and um, you know if you know if there's my I guess my thought is why are we doing this now why don't we wait for the plan but if you feel and the planning board feels that that they need something now um, I'd appreciate it if you came to us and made some suggestions that this is what the planning department thinks we ought to do now. This is what you're asking us for now. Um, I don't know. Is that director Marshall? Yeah. I think the planning board, if at this point the, this committee's idea is to just reaffirm that what they've been doing to be fair and accurate and how they've been interpreting this is is fine until we get to the master plan. I think the planning board would be fine with that. Um, they just want some reassurance because they get quite a few of these requests that they're operating in the correct manner at the moment. Um, if, if what I will just say is some context is there's no other specific section that has a waiver provision um, as part of the way the the, the planning board has the right to waive specific things, right, that are laid out in there. This is a very odd in how it's constructed. They can waive, um, in certain instances, say, setbacks, right, or they have the ability to, drain, to negotiate over this type of drainage versus this type. There's not, um, this is an incredibly prescriptive waiver process that is unique in the code itself. And that was done specifically because the city had this larger public purpose to finish to to provide a much better pedestrian habitat and to be able to fund the priority places through the quadrant funds. So if if this committee thinks that um, you know this is really a good discussion as part of the master plan and updating the land use ordinance as a whole with all these kind of issues, I think they would be fine for you to reaffirm, you know, kind of as it's been. If this is something that you feel like is a priority that needs to be taken up now, Absolutely, this is something that my staff can look at and try to um, come up with a better suggestion on. But I, I think, I, I don't know if that's the right step to take at this point. And that's what the board was looking for direction from you on. Because if you do want to rewrite it, I think they would like to participate too. And Alderman Laws and then Alderman Schmidt. Um, I, I agree with Alderman Jetty and I would love if the board would participate in rewriting this. I, I just, uh, have you reached out to Corporation Council about this? My only concern is, are we going to get sued by somebody 
who reads this and is like, there's not a verb in that sentence, <laughs> you know? Um, Corporation <coughs> Council has been involved many times over the years in determinations, uh, discussions around this ordinance. Um, I don't have a fear that we're gonna get sued at this moment. Okay. You do have the prerogative to update your ordinances when you feel like they're no longer serving the best purpose. Um, and it is your, it is the Board of Aldermen's job to do so um, with the planning board's support. And so um, if you feel like this is something that we should take up now, I, I can tell you in this, this time of increased activity and strong financial markets, this is when people are trying to subdivide and build and do a lot of work. And so it comes up a lot. If we were in a um, more of a downturn econ economy-wise, this isn't so much of a factor because there's much less activity. Um, so it's, it's up to you how you want to present it, but the planning board rarely comes across something that is constantly frustrating them and the applicant, and so that's why they kind of turned to you. A follow-up, Alderman Laws? Well, the, your last sentence there is going to bother me because I don't want to create any more frustration for anybody than they already got because I know how complicated this stuff can be. But it seems to me that this is not particularly urgent. We're not at any legal jeopardy right now. And it's already going to be worked out in the master plan within the next, hopefully, couple of days, right? That comes out. So <laughs> yes. it, it just doesn't, doesn't seem like the, it's something that we necessarily need to act on now. If the frustration is something that is unnavigable, then uh, I mean, maybe we should work on it. But I mean, it, it, it seems like they've been dealing with And if, if since the economy is doing so well, it doesn't seem like it's something that's going to be deterring anyone from subdividing any land right now. Right. If we were in a downturn, I could see it being something that might deter someone from investing in the city, but I don't think that's a real issue right now. Agreed. Am I, am I wrong? You are correct. All right. Okay, but just, I think to your point, if I understood you correctly, we're going to see more subdivisions, so this question may be coming before them. So, they have, so there may be more opportunities to be frustrated. Am I correct? Not that it's a barrier to people subdividing, but that as people start subdividing, in fact, I just saw property driving over here today that's going to be subdivided. Um, and and so those folks come forward and then they, you know, it's, well, do they have to put a sidewalk or not, or do, do they pay the waiver into the quadrant fee? So I think that that's, it's not stopping development, but it is providing another time for the planning board, who I think tries to be very, very fair in this, um, to say, okay, are we doing the right thing? And and I know just in the past year and a half, they've had at least two workshops on sidewalks, looking at where's the closest one and and all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Alderman Schmidt. It's perfectly okay. So the, the problem is mostly where there's infill. Is that right? And the problem is probably also that is there a sidewalk already there? If it's in the middle of a street, a piece of sidewalk in the middle doesn't make a lot of sense. Correct. Um, how often do, do they need to uh, make this decision? How often is this uh, used? Um, I, probably since the beginning of the this year, um, since January, I think they've had four waiver requests. Since um, January. And so I do think if you reaffirm that what they've been doing, assuming that everybody has to have a frontage <coughs> and calculate it that way, that they will con they will they will feel good about the decisions they're making that way. Um, but pretty much everybody's gonna ask for a waiver because just to be clear, it's a really good deal. Right. <laughs> um, it, the, what we charge is $50 a linear foot um, and in the, some of the information you are provided, it costs more be, around 150 to actually construct one. And in places, we, we might not want a sidewalk in the middle, like like you mm -hmm. said, in here and there's no sidewalks on either side. Um, I think people just would prefer to keep money themselves, reasonably so, than having to pay for this. And so people always ask, because they have the right to ask. Um, Alderman Schmidt, follow up, and then Alderman So, so I, I think I agree with you. I think that they are doing a fine job if, if the process is working right now. And I think that when we, when we do the uh, update on all of this, that it would be the right time to make the changes. Thank you. Alderman Laws? Took the words out of my mouth. Alderman Jetty. So <coughs> if, the, um, if what we're charging for a waiver is, uh, you know, one-third of what it would cost them to put the sidewalk in, um, you know, does that make any sense? I mean, who, who would not opt for the waiver? Um, 
I mean, if we're trying to encourage people to put in sidewalks, I mean, should should we look at, you know, is is that uh, cost of the waiver? Is that in the ordinance? Uh, it says the planning board has the authorization to establish a, ski, a fee schedule, in the f for it, and the fee schedule that they've established is fifty dollars per linear foot. They haven't looked at increasing that. Um, they have not looked at increasing that. So, yes, yeah, Councilor Minichetti. So I don't want to do anything to uh, to interfere with uh, with you know what the planning department feels are the goals here, but my you know, and and I may be completely wrong about this, but I'm thinking, why doesn't the planning board increase the the fee? It uh, if it's one third of the co the actual cost, um, why don't they increase you know triple it so that it's 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 commensurate with what it costs because I don't know if I'm wrong, but if I'm if I'm a developer and I can pay you fifty bucks a foot and then let you put the sidewalk in for a hundred and fifty bucks a foot, why wouldn't I do that? What? So um, just to clarify, they will require the sidewalk if you're putting in a brand new road. They they will not give a waiver. If there's a place where there's a sidewalk that is required and needed, they are not giving waivers. People, they're not, and most people don't ask for them because they're trying to <coughs> produce a good product that needs a sub that needs a sidewalk anyways. And so you'll notice any of the larger sub large subdivisions that have gone in, they all have sidewalks, and that's the way it goes. Um, the waiver is for instances where it's maybe not the best place to put a sidewalk because there wouldn't be some on either side. Uh, I think the planning board has talked about this briefly, um, but they. It's it's a, it's adding three times the cost onto somebody who's subdividing really a single lot or some place that they don't feel like having the sidewalk built is in the best interest of the city, um, and so they have not made a decision to increase those fees. They just looked at them. They talked about this. They acknowledged that, um, but I do think that's part of the larger policy discussion that will come with the master planning process as well. So on it. If you look at it um, in the larger picture, I think where they actually see it being applied, they're just not sure that that really balances out. Um, Alderwoman Kelly, did I see your hand? I was just interested in what the cost of the sidewalk per foot was. Sure. Um, it's, it's okay. Me, yep. Um, it's it, um, and these are from. Um, so from last year, um, from City Engineer Dukren, um, that a um, sidewalk with vertical granite curb, which is what we require, is um, $126 a linear foot. A concrete sidewalk with vertical granite curb is $140 a square foot. Um, we do allow um, waivers of the street construction standards, which would allow you to do sloped granite curb, which would be about $10 less in inch, each instance per linear foot. So those were last summer's numbers. I think I said this a couple meetings ago in a different context, but um, things are much more expensive this summer than yeah. they were last summer <laughs> in general. Um, so, it, it, I mean, building a sidewalk is, is expensive. Um, and those are the city numbers versus, you know, having somebody else do it. And the planning board is not waiving these in areas where there's a new road being constructed. They're absolutely requiring them in those instances. I, I guess, you know, um, from a, a big picture look, waiving, wa waiving the sidewalk and collecting the fee of $50 um, makes sense if we don't need a sidewalk there. But I guess at a higher elevation because we are using this this money is being used to put in sidewalks where we know we need sidewalks. Um, wondering if it may not be time to relook at what their fee schedule is. Um, and I hate to put this out there, but I know I've been involved in some just kind of general conversation. Um, in the mayor's office about pedestrian and bike routes. And so I think that's another part of this as we start looking at what are we doing for a pedestrian bike plan? How does that dovetail with where we have 
existing sidewalk or need existing sidewalk. And, and I think that's a piece that the planning board needs also so they know like this property is being subdivided and when you look at our pedestrian plan, this is where this property falls. So this is what the long-term future vision is for this property as part of a bigger neighborhood. And, and so I think that's something we also have to consider as we put all of this together. I think in the past, um, we haven't really focused much on pedestrians. It's been like, oh, you want to go for a walk in your neighborhood? Fine. Um, but pedestrians actually walking to get somewhere besides getting their steps in. Um, I think is, you know, how we're, neighbors are starting to look at, at what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, can I walk down to a bus stop or can I cut through a subdivision to get to my place of employment rather than driving there every day? Um, so I think that that's another part of the puzzle that needs to be incorporated into this conversation and with the planning board. Absolutely. I mean, the plan that you saw here that is was attached from the 2000 plan is is certainly not enough of a basis for the planning board to move forward with a lot of things on in today's day and age. Um, and the bike ped master plan, a piece of that plan, um, doing some of that work is absolutely something that's on the table for discussion. It would give the planning board a lot more guidance along this issue um, and I think would be very helpful in many, many aspects of the work that many of us are doing here. So I would very much echo that. And I think the planning board would be extremely appreciative of a plan to base decisions off of. Alderman Laws. Uh, so I was going to comment on that as well. And I'm glad you did. Um, and I'm glad your response is satisfactory to me. I, my concern would be if we adjust the fee schedule right now, like we're, they're already frustrated. Uh, and we're just giving them something. We're making it a little bit more complicated because now the conversation is going to get a little more heated between them and developers, right? So why don't we just wait, or why don't we encourage them to wait until the master plan comes out and this all gets rectified before we start messing around with finding a, another sweet spot? That would just be my suggestion. Um, Alderwoman Kelly. Um, I'm just visiting, but and I'm not a city planner or anything like that, but my, the question that comes to my mind is, if you're on a road that doesn't currently have sidewalks, my my thought would be that the point of this is to slowly get them there. So at what point do are we just propelling the same thing of, well, Main Dunstable doesn't have sidewalks, so you don't need to put in a sidewalk. So then it ends up becoming a city issue where we have to put in the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Director Marshall? That's a great question. It is it is somewhat chicken and egg. Um, and so I think, you know, the planning board looks seriously when somebody comes before them with a subdivision on if they think it's needed and in the best interest of the city. Part of that review has comments from engineering um, and the city engineer also sits on the board. And so if there's a time where they think it fits in, then they're going to require it. Um, but they also, we, we are also not a huge fan of having a chunk of sidewalk that's not attached to anything else because in theory we're supposed to maintain it which adds a lot of year-over-year -year costs. Um, and that's one of the reasons why this sidewalk fund was created to direct funds from your neighborhood into the same neighborhood to hit those high-priority sidewalks first and slowly be able to build it out backwards. So that was an attempt at the solution to not end up with a checkerboard of mm -hmm. places where we're in the road and off trying to maintain. If I could follow up. Yes. I imagine you might have this in your strategic goals, but do we have a plan in terms of how to prioritize areas and where where sidewalks go first? Um, it's this plan, um, which is why I think the idea of a bike ped master plan, which could break this down a little bit further and provide a lot more clarity, um, even in, you know, such as these types of roads, these are, we need sidewalks here first. And these, I think that there could be a lot more guidance that could be part of a plan that would help them make decisions. Yes. Thank you. Anyone? I, I have a question, but I don't want to. Okay. If anyone has something. Um, two questions. Master planning is probably two, three years out? Um, I think you, you mean being completed? Yeah. Um, I, I hope two at the max, two hopefully. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, bike head plan. I think part of it would be 
part of this. Um, part of it would be part of a master planning process. Um, a, a more in-depth bike plan, a, a surface level one that would be better than this. An in-depth bike plan, plan, I think, is an active conversation with adding bike lanes, um, working with the Regional Planning Commission, um, and some others right now. So um, we might be able to get a more in-depth one done before that. Um, and I think that the cost of that was significantly less than clearly a, ma a whole master plan. Okay. I, I guess my thought is um, the from my perspective, um, the the bike ped plan to me seems to be really important, um, not only because it's part of the master plan, but also because having that gives some real concrete information to the planning board and some direction. Because I know sometimes we have conversations here about how we, <coughs> excuse me, how we see um, walkability developing and and the planning board members aren't always part of those conversations or even hear the detail. There may be a conversation over a cup of coffee somewhere that isn't captured. And so I think we sit here and, and the aldermen sit with a perspective of what we want at a high level, but that always doesn't get clearly communicated to our land use boards. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess the thing I would like to see as you know and coming full circle to what information could we use i think we're all comfortable with this um but i think like other conversations we've had is it possible to at least get something in terms of that bike ped plan that will provide better guidance for the planning board and i don't know how everyone else feels about that but that that to me seems to be the priority and might also give them some comfort in how they're doing their job, which I think they're doing very well, but at least give them another piece of information that they can hold on to to say, yes, we're taking the city in the direction it wants to go. Any thoughts, comments? That's Alderwoman Kelly. Um, I would agree with that. I think that besides potholes, bike lanes is probably the number two thing we hear about um, when we're out and about and at beer with the mayor, coffee with the mayor, people really are interested in how that's going to develop. And, um, you know, I'd love to be able to watch walk my daughter to school. So I think having that information will help guide us. So if that's something we can put in, I would definitely be behind it. Yeah. Alderman Jetty. So I'm looking at um, Mr. LeClear's, uh, Chairman LeClear's memo. And... Uh, <coughs> it says the planning board seeks guidance from the Planning and Economic Development Committee if the current ordinance is still viable from a policy perspective given the nearing build the nearing build out status of the city. The planning board questioned whether the ordinance could be made clearer and more specific relative to corner or triple frontage lots and whether it could be applied to every lot with no waivers. Um, so seems to be asking something pretty direct mm -hmm. of, of us. And I, I guess I would like to suggest that we, I mean, you know, personally, my, my response would, would be to Director Marchand, you know, what does the planning uh, department you know, what guidance would they do? Would they like to see us give to the planning board? You know, again, we're we're not the planners. I mean, we're we're on the planning committee, but we're not professional planners. You know, do you, you know, is this something that you could say to us? You know, these are the. I mean, I, I've 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 pointed out one little area where the. You know, I think the ordinance needs change. You know, needs amending. It's not, and uh, I'm wondering whether you, 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 and your department could come back to us with some uh, recommended amendments to the ordinance, and uh, for us to consider. You know. Director Marshall. 
I think I, I would go back to the, the first sentence is, is it still viable from a poly policy perspective? And what I've kind of heard tonight is that it is and that we'd like to take this up as part of the larger master plan process. I don't feel comfortable coming back with some edits about verbs that are missing. I think that this, if we were to come back to you with edits to this ordinance, I think that it is a, it's a, it's a much larger discussion about the overall policy perspective and should there be a waiver provision written in here? Should there be a contribution in lieu of and clarifying the entire subsections because there are so many pieces that do not align well. I don't feel like it's something I could come back with one page of, you know, typo type corrections where in other places there might be. I, I do think that this is a much larger discussion and I do think that the public will ha want to have a good say in it. And so if that's something that you think is, uh, you want to undertake, I'm happy to support that. But I just think it's not a quick, easy discussion. I do think that the development community will want to be here and have a say about how this is looked at and how it's applied. Um, I think the planning board would like to be involved in the discussion. And like I said, I'm happy to do that if that's what we want to do. But um, if you want to do that as part of the master plan process, I think that's fine as well. Can I, oh, the uh, so, um, so help me understand what what um, Chairman Leclerc is is looking for. Is is he looking for us to to do that? For us to um, to say that we're happy waiting for the master plan. I mean, you know, is there a problem now? It seems to be. I've, um, but you're, you're saying, you seem to be saying, no, that things are fine the way they are until the uh, master plan gets done. I, I think that the planning board has acknowledged that there is frustration over this and that they don't feel like it's clear cut. I think that they've come up with a system that they try to apply as fairly and evenly as possible. They acknowledge the problem. If this board feels like they're doing fine with how they're interpreting this to the best that they can, and that this is something that you would pick up later, I think the planning board will be fine with this. If you feel like this is a priority to move forward with this discussion to break this down more, they will also be on board with that. I don't think that they are, you know, out of the last, say, 10 waivers, probably eight of them were pretty clear cut for their process and they could figure this out. These um, double frontage, triple frontage lots just cause a lot more discussion um, back and forth and they try very hard to apply it as fairly as possible. If what they've been doing is, again, a policy perspective, from a policy perspective standpoint, something that you're comfortable with, they're okay with having that reassurance knowing that this is going to be taken up as part of fixing larger with the master plan. If you feel like we are not investing in our sidewalks the way we want to be at this moment, and this is something that we should pick up, then that's something else. And they're okay with either of it. They're just looking for some guidance on you. They are not the policy board. In other non-city towns, they would have the jurisdiction to just be like, we don't think this works. We're going to hold public hearings and try and make this work. That's not how it's set up here in Nashua. You are the policy. You are the policy board. You make the policy decisions, and they implement a lot of those in large part. Alderman Jetty, follow yeah, so, up. So just to follow up, I, I guess I'm. I don't feel. You know, I don't feel confident saying that things are fine the way they are. I don't know how things are. I mean, I. I mean, I. You know, we just. I think we got this a week a week ago, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm really not sure how what they've been doing and whether or not I feel that what they're doing is is okay or not. Um, you know, they they evidently think there's a problem because they've brought this up. So mm -hmm. I guess I, I think we ought to spend some time, you know, researching or finding out from them exactly more about uh, you know what. You know how we can help them. So, um, it just for people who don't have this in front of them, the planning board question whether the ordinance could be made clear. 
um, and more specific relative to um, corner and triple frontage lots and whether it should be applied to every lot with no waivers. So those were the, the two things um, they questioned. I'm wondering, Director Marchant, if we um, table this discussion and come back at our next meeting with maybe um, some examples of um, times items have come to the planning board that they've had to look at that relate to these specific examples, the corner and triple frontage lots. And, and if one or, you know, if Mr. LeClaire or um, someone else and or someone else from the planning board would like to join him and we could have a conversation. Um, I know I came away from the sidewalk workshop meeting with them saying, we're doing this and we feel like we're doing it consistently, but we want to know that someone else thinks we're doing it consistently and that we're okay. And if if people feel we're doing it and we're consistent and we're it's in keeping with what the city wants, then we'll keep doing it till there's a master plan. But I think, um, to your point, Alderman Jetty, if we had some more information, then maybe we could better determine, okay, this is fine, let's leave it. or. Now, after looking at it a little more in depth, maybe we really do need to have further discussion and bring in the um, bike ped plan and, and maybe really open this up and look at it. And then when we do come to master planning, there'll be a piece that can more easily slide into that. Um, so, um, Alderman Laws? I was gonna suggest that if we invite Chairman LeClaire, I feel like it would, Yes. Clear up a lot of the confusion about what's going on. Because we're basically we're, we're, we're <coughs> interpreting his letter and trying to decide what he thinks is important mm -hmm. when we could just ask him. So I support tabling it 100%. Yeah. Okay. Back, so. so do I have, um, well, before we do that, um, I gave my interpretation of what I think we need. Is there anything else anyone would like? Director Marchant to bring to us, um, just so I don't I don't want her to get here at the next meeting and someone say, oh, I wish we had. And I know it's hard to anticipate that because this is something we're not used to talking about. But um, besides some specific examples, um, Alderman Jetty, I, I was uh, I I don't want to uh, I don't want to upset the chain of command, but uh, I'm thinking. You know, would um, Mr. Houston be a, a good person to have here? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I would say if whoever you would like to bring and um, invite um, Mr. LeClaire and um, I'm s certainly if other members of the planning board would like to come if we know so we can notice the meeting as there may be a quorum of the planning board here also. I think we have enough seats to accommodate everyone um, does that work for everyone okay so do I have a motion to table until our okay alderman laws and it will be to table to our June meeting okay all those in favor aye, aye. opposed okay all right thank you director Marchant um <coughs> and um, I'm sorry, I went straight under discussions and presentations. We have a communication, um, and if there are no objections, um, we will accept in place on file the um, communication from Scott LeClaire, Chair of Planning Board, and the um, Planning Board members requesting us to review um, and give policy direction on the sidewalk ordinance. Um, so unfinished business, we have none and new business, um, resolution R19-134. So we need a motion. <coughs> I have a motion. Uh, I'll move for final passage of, uh, R19-134. Okay. And um, Director Marchant kindly copied the strategic planning goals, um, and we'll pass those around. 
Um, the strategic planning committee is under, thank you, under the, the um, planning and economic development committee. And originally, um, two, four years ago maybe, um, before I was chairing PEDC, so it must have been two terms ago, um, they had met, and at that time the committee was made up of division directors. And um, as they met and started talking about strategic planning, it was determined that um, rather than having city employees um, involved in doing the strategic planning, it, the committee should really be made up of representatives from the elected boards in the city. So um, the le there was um, new legislation and, um, and that happened, it was accepted, and so then at that point there was the election um, and as the new chair of PEDC we began meeting. Um, as Director Marchand can tell you, that was often difficult getting a quorum because we had chairs and representatives from many of the boards in the city who had their own busy agendas. Um, but we had fire, we had police, we had Department of Public Works, um, library, board of ed, um, the airport, then we had infrastructure committee chair or their representative, the mayor's office representative, um, someone from PEDC and budget. I believe, oh, and the library board of trustees. I think I got all of them. And um, <coughs> Director Marchant and Director Cummings um, gave of their time to guide us through this process and we, I think like many of us when we go through these processes, we, we start and we think we're going and then it's like, oh wait, I'm doing this all backwards. Let me take some steps back. And so we did that a couple of times and our board members changed. And we got to finally the resolution that you, you see before you with the strategic planning goals. And I will just tell you that um, up until the last meeting, each of these goals had bullets under them and then we looked at them and I think through our own personal growth with Director Marchant's um, support, we all realized, wait, those bullets are very prescriptive and um, we don't want to be that prescriptive. We, we really want to encourage all of the division heads to look at these goals, keep them in mind, but not say this is a must do for your department. Um, so. If you're thinking, well, why isn't there a goal with three objectives? We went from a goal with eight objectives to a goal with two or three to, wait, why do we even have objectives? They should be writing their own. Um, so that's the kind of overview of what the process felt like. I, I'm going to let Director Marsha more eloquently talk about what the purpose of this is and, and why, how this document should be used and how we envision it being used across the city. I think that was a great intro. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and about the evolution of the process. It is the 30,000 foot view um, and it is because there was all these different boards and commissions involved, the idea was to really lay a very high level framework from which then we hope and um, I believe there's some commitment by many of them to take these forward and look at our budget and how we do business within each of the divisions or the sections of the city within these this context and this frame and to kind of start pulling that down and creating the goals and objectives and looking at how we do business through that process um, and to keep this as a very high level document. So that's what you have here. Um, you know, we looking at every book and other strategic planning processes and how we do things. Um, it seemed that the best role for this committee was really to stay at that high level and to allow the individual um, boards of the library trustees or the airport or the mayor or the police commissioners to really set the agenda, the bullet points, the objectives, the action items and bring that forward to you through the budgeting process. So that is, that is how we got here and why we're here. And um, I think that they are um, some pretty strong 
positions that the city can take that we can fit the work we do generally with under. So with that comment, um, we're open for discussion. I will also say that um, the mayor and I had a conversation about this and again, I, I felt like we hit our target because it was high level enough that it gives everyone the opportunity to then develop their own objectives um, as they're putting a budget together. And I think um, the one comment that was made several times across our work putting this together was that different divisions will be at different stages every year as they do budget prep. So one year, someone might need a higher percentage than someone else, but it's, it's how you're making it all work together. So it doesn't assume that everyone's just gonna get a flat across the board increase in their budget. Um, and, and I think that makes sense in terms of what the priorities are at a given time in the city and um, where people are currently in meeting those priorities and how much support they may need going forward. So um, the number eight was added as we got into the process, um, the city being a good steward of its natural resources and environment, which, um, you know, it, that could apply to DPW, it could apply to the school department, it could apply to, mm -hmm. um, the airport authority, I mean, there's uh, there's not one department in the city that's not involved in some way with natural resources. So that's just an example of how we were looking at those. People could choose some of those that applied to address with their budget, and, and people would be shooting towards the same target, but from their unique perspective. And... Again, if people want to have further conversation about these, start tonight and table or whatever the preferences of the committee. <coughs> <coughs> Questions, comments? <coughs> Excuse me, Alderman Lars and Alderman Jetty. Uh, uh, it looks good to me. I don't, I wasn't there for your conversations. I trust the, uh, I trust both of you, first of all. And uh, it makes sense to me. I appreciate the fact that you got rid of the bullets, to be honest, and left it to me more broad. Uh, and I <coughs> support this. Thank you. Alderman Jetty? I, I was just going to ask, um, so, uh, <coughs> I was going to try to look it up, but uh, the Strategic Planning Committee, how does that fit into um, our, our uh, scheme of ordinances? And <coughs> I can't remember where it is, but it's, it's, it's listed almost as a subcommittee of PEDC. So, and, and, and it's made up of members, as I said, of budget, infrastructure, and PDC. Um, so it's, and it, it kind of functions as needed. Um, and it's specifically for this purpose. May I? Yes. So. <coughs> Excuse me. A few. Go ahead. I'm very empathetic to your... She's all blue. You know what? No, that's okay. It's, I'm, it's getting late, and I know my voice is just getting tired. Okay, well, I don't want to prolong... No, no, go ahead. ...prolong your agony. No. But, uh, it, I'm a speech pathologist, so I know what to do when I get home. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So the Strategic Planning Committee, is that the committee that, that kind of looks at, um, you know, whether we should be... Um, planning on buying a new fire truck no, or no that's capital no? improvement or yeah capital capital improvement, improvement. yeah okay this this committee is really only about setting up citywide goals that drive citywide 
budget practice and and goals for the city. So it's here are the citywide goals. They're adopted. So the board's saying these are the things we think are priorities, and these are the goals, the eight goal areas you should have. The mayor then can say, yeah, and these dovetail with these goals of mine, and the division directors and the elected boards then say, okay, this is what we're committed to. These are the things we say are priorities. And I believe it's, we meet every two years to reevaluate these. Okay. And, and I would just say, just, just so people know, this is the first bite at the apple. Prior to this, this committee had, had not functioned, even though it was on the books. So um, I anticipate that in two years, this will be refined just, you know, as we move forward and priorities change. But just so you know, this is the initial document. So I, I'll save you time going back and looking for what does the last strategic planning goal mm -hmm. set look like. There, It wasn't there. This is the initial one. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to prolong things. No, no. The, uh, the, you know, this looks fine to me. It looks like a, you know, like a mission statement. You know, kind of, mm -hmm. and uh, b but there is a committee that's looking at, you know, that uh, for example, it ought to be a priority for us to, um, you know, have a, a another pedestrian bridge across the river somewhere, or a, right. another vehicle bridge across the river somewhere. That that's what strategic planning does. That those would be sub goals in here under whoever would be doing be the capital the improvements, improvements committee. Right. And the capital improvements committee hears from the divisions and commissions right. and boards directly about what they feel the capital improvements of the city need to be, and then they prioritize those on an annual basis. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank those you. those items that you're talking about are um as Director Marchand said, the Capital Improvements Committee, um, they get input from the division directors. Um, and those are the things that you'll see have an A1 rating or a B1 rating, and, and we get those, and, and it's fed into the budget. And I think you've probably heard some of us say some of those things have been going to capital improvements for a number of years because even though they have high ratings, and, and I will give you an example, um, I know you all got the invitation for the shade canopy that um, is going to be going in at Roby Park. Um, that has been to capital improvements and has gotten a high rating, but when you take that against a new roof for the police station or the fire station, those things, even if they're both A1, we need to put the roof in. So um, that's where those things go. Other questions, comments? So the motion was, um, was the recommendation? Final passage. Final passage. Any other questions, comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And I thank you in many ways because these committee members are very hard to get together so um, they and they thank you and if you meet any of them please thank them because um, they worked very hard and gave up their time so we could get this done um, the um, other piece of legislation we have is um, tabled in committee do I have a motion to take 019042 from the table director Marchand thank you so much um, I guess we will see you in June. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, a motion to take 019, do that. okay, from um, Alderman Schmidt. 019-042. Uh, from the table. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and I have a motion um, to recommend final passage for discussion. So moved. So moved. Alderman Jetty um, recommending final passage of 019-042. And um, Alderwoman Kelly, thank you for being here this evening. I know you had another meeting, so we appreciate you joining oh, us. Sorry, I missed the last one. No, that's... 
Um, so this piece of legislation is sort of the the last step in a lot of work that's been done by this commission, and I believe it started before I was on the commission. Um, looking back as far as I could, um, minute wise, this has been a labor of love in terms of finding the parcels, going out, looking at the parcels, um, coming up with a maintenance and stewardship plan, and that's been you know happening over the last year to two years, and. Now it's just designating it, giving it a name, and saying what we're behind conserving this land. Um, I know that Brian was a big part of this. Um, we just dedicated a bridge to him um, recently, and he was a big part of making sure that these conservation lands happen um, in our city. So that's that's the background I got on this, but if you have questions, I can try to answer them. Just um, for, for people who may be listening, um, could you roughly describe where the parcels are that we're, we're putting together here? Yeah, actually, they're right in my neighborhood. Um, <laughs> they're, um, I'm looking at the map right now, but they are off of Buck Meadow. Um, there's one, two, three, four pieces right by Buck Meadow, um, a, a long ridge road as well, and then some across Ridge Road um, going right up against Lovewell Pond, so... There's seven parcels that we're putting right. together for the entire Southwest Conservation Land. Right. And so it's abutting existing conservation land yep. also. It is. Okay. Any questions, comments? Alderman what, Jetta. What's the number? I yeah, it's 019042. And there's a map connected to if the public can right, look I'm at it too. To, I'm trying to. I, I looked at it before. I'm just trying to look look at it right now. Um. Yes. Do you know how many acres are uh, are going to be, and they will be contiguous, right? a great question I can't tell by looking at the map myself I can ask um, and get you an actual like, acreage but if you could if I could put it up there you would see that there's quite a bit you, pieces you oh I can let me, let me do that I just need mashup.gov I just, while well, um, Alderwoman Kelly's bringing up the map, um, I know one of the things we often talk about is light pollution. And um, and I know many of you know Alderman McCarthy um, enjoyed seeing the night sky. And um, these conservation lands certainly provide an area where people can go and see the night sky with minimal light pollution. So, um, you know, we, we think about conserving the land, but it's also um, providing a sad opportunity at night to see what's in the sky. Alderman Jetty. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, this area is um, mostly in my ward, and it's, mm -hmm. it's a great area. I was out there, uh, a bunch of us were out there Saturday to right. dedicate the bridge to... Uh, um, Alderman uh, McCarthy, and uh, it's you know it's a it's a it's a beautiful area. It's great that that uh, we're doing this, uh, but I, I believe that the uh, that this land has already been deeded to the city, and it has uh, deed restrictions on it that uh, that make it conservation land. What what is um, what is the purpose of um, what is this doing that that to uh, uh, to add to that? Is it just naming it the Southwest Conservation Area, or is there something else that gives a an, an advantage to this that that we're doing tonight? I think it's identifying it as one large piece together. I know that the Northwest Quadrant, um, the Northwest Sanctuary, has a similar. Um, step process in terms of okay, here are all the pieces there together, um, and I think it's just for ease too, right? Being able to say the 
um, Southwest conservation lands a lot easier than C15 or C13 or when we're talking about stewardship mm -hmm. or maintenance or anything like that. Um, I think it, they, they have plans to put in signage and stuff like that too. So I think that helps in that area as well. Sorry if I'm not speaking, but <laughs> my mic's usually over here. Um, so I did pull it up on the map here. Um, so what we're talking about, um, this is Ridge Road here. Um, and it's all backwards because I turned around. Here's Buck Meadow. So this is kind of where we were over the weekend um, dedicating. And this day all kind of connect to each other in some place or another. But it's a, it's a decent amount of conservation land. As you point, it's already been acquired and deeded. So again, final step. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? So um, the motion was to recommend final passage. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alderwoman Kelly. Have a good evening. Public comment? Um, no one is here. Remarks by Alderman? Um, just two things again. Um, as I said, we're, the announcement's going to formally be made at Roby Park tomorrow about the shade canopy, which um, <coughs> um, Alderman Presley actually um, is the person who started that, and she had heard some concerns and contacted me and said, we need to do this. So... Um, I actually called her when I was made aware of this gift, and she was very excited. So um, I want to publicly thank her for all of her efforts in, in moving this forward. Um, the other thing is um, we, we did do the um, de rededication of the bridge and unveiling of the plaque on Saturday um, in the conserva conservation land off of Buck Meadow. Um, and then later in the day, there was the um, opening of the artist studios. And um, although Alderman Gidge wasn't able to be there, just um, I think we all need to acknowledge his efforts in, in making that um, a reality. So um, again, to publicly thank him for, for moving that forward and, and making sure it got done. And um, hopefully he'll be joining us soon so we can personally thank him around the horseshoe. Um, no need for a non-public session. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Move. Alderman Laws? Yeah, moved. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And we are adjourned at 848. Everyone, thank you very much. Yeah.